With that said, I will be introducing our first keynote speaker, Mr. Patrice Bailey, who is the Assistant Commissioner uh, for the Department of Food and Ag, in, or Department of Agriculture, rather. After graduating with his bachelor's degree in agriculture education from Prairie View A&M University in Texas, he traveled to the Virgin Islands to learn about agriculture in the West Indies. His passion for feeding and clothing the world at large continued to grow uh, as well with each new life experience. He then received his master's degree in agriculture education at Iowa State, spent time in uh, New York, and now we welcome him here uh, as a, a assistant commissioner of the Food and Ag. And so we're excited to hear a little bit about Patrice's story and uh, his experience as coming from a diverse background and as an African-American into the state of Minnesota in the department. So please help me welcome Patrice Bailey. Well, it is so great to be here. Um, I, uh, I was telling uh, Tom Peterson, my boss, the commissioner, um, it's just so crazy of all the things that are happening. Um, when you're thinking about things that are happening around the world. Um, and so what I would like to do is talk about a little bit about my journey coming from Harlem where I grew up to where we are today and sort of looking beyond today is sort of that, uh, the theme. So again, my name is Patrice Bailey. Um, I serve as one of the four commissioners here at uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And uh, the way that the, the um, agency is sort of broken out is about 450 to 500 uh, uh, state employees. Um, and there are two assistant uh, commissioners that sort of split up uh, six divisions. So I have sort of, <laughs> seems like the bigger ones. I have feed and food safety, which includes um, all the, wine, uh, the breweries, the wineries, and uh, manufactured pet food. I have dairy and meat inspection. And I also have ag marketing and development, which sort of has like 13 other things like Minnesota Grown and Ag in the Classroom and all of those things is under my portfolio. So we can. So as you can see, my journey of, of, of um, New York is that the thing that you don't see minus a few trees is any land, right? In terms of uh, agricultural land, everything is concrete, big buildings everywhere. And so um, the picture on the, the left is Harlem and the picture on the right is still Harlem too. It's just that I wanted to sort of put that contrast there of the things that I see or saw um, in terms of perception. The next one. More things that are happening. This is 42nd Street. I don't know how much the, the light bill is for 42nd Street, but it's like this during the daytime with all these lights all the time. But it's a lot of hustle and bustle, and it's more of an on-demand type of economy in New York of 16 million people. And so um, I don't think that a lot of people really think or really care about where agriculture comes from in terms of their food as long as it's right there on the shelf when they are uh, buying their, um, their items. Next slide. So the question is why agriculture and um, you know, what was it that sort of drew me in to agriculture? Well, you can go to the next slide. So it wasn't until my senior year um, I had six months left. My mom said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. And she said, well, there's too many lawyers out there. Why don't you do something that you can always feed yourself in any part of the world that you may happen to find yourself? And I said, well, what is that? And she said, agriculture. And I said, oh, I don't want to be a farmer. Next slide. I don't want to be a farmer because the stereotypes that I always have seen have been these stereotypes of tractors. And being that I grew up in Harlem, I didn't, I didn't see tractors. We didn't see you know, knee high in July. We didn't see any <laughs> apple orchards. Um, and, and so my perception and stereotypes of agriculture was extremely negative. And she was like, trust me, you can't see it right now, but just go to Texas and give, give me a year. If you don't like it, go to law school. So next slide. So one of the things that I did, I did that very thing. I went to, uh, to Prairie View A&M University. 
Uh, it's historically black college and university is one of the uh, one of 13 uh, historically black colleges and universities for agriculture and mechanical. And so um, my first trip was going to Chicago, it was the World Food Expo, and I saw uh, Dan Glickman, who was the Secretary of Agriculture at the time. And I said, oh wow, that's, who is that? And started meeting a couple of people. Still I had this negative connotation of agriculture until I walked through these doors. As I walked through the doors, the first thing that I saw was the glacier water, it was Coca-Cola, was I mean, all the big names were right there, but these were the CEOs that were greeting you. And so I'm, I'm walking through, and then I see the Petra's Farm commercial guy. I don't know how many people remember this guy. His name is Charlie Welch. He used to be in this hammock, and he used to talk about how great uh, um, Petra's Farm products were. I'm like, that's the guy. Oh my God, I can't believe it. So I spoke to him for an hour and after I, I had the conversation with him, I was sold on agriculture. And I didn't look back um, since. And so we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that continue to happen, and we talk about the hands of time move very slowly. Well, they really do when you're thinking about it because um, you know, if you're thinking about agriculture in Minnesota, it's, it's extremely, it's very white. Um, so it wasn't until 2019 that this had, that sort of cycle broke. And so thanks to, um, to Tom Peterson that he didn't want the same old thing happening. He wanted to reach out to other communities. And so here we are, 136 years later. Um, and this is where we, where we continue to, to keep moving. Um, but um, I have to say agriculture in Minnesota is in a good position. That's one thing I can say. Um, but we still have issues when it comes to our uh, emerging farmers. Next slide. So this is the team. It's uh, Tom Peterson, there's Andrea, there's Peter Chessett, um, and myself. And so uh, these are the folks that, uh, that run the agency. And um, I was saying Pater, so I had those three. So with Pater, uh, his three folks that he, um, the divisions that he managed is um, pesticide management uh, division. Uh, he also has plant protection. He also has, uh, we share a lab with the uh, Department of, uh, of uh, Health. Sorry, they have more real estate than we do. Um, but we're in the agriculture building, the, the Freeman building, named after Mike Freeman's uh, dad, who used to be the Secretary of Agriculture during the uh, Lyndon Johnson administration. Next slide. So the mission that we have is really to protect the, um, the, the food supply for six million people, six million plus. But um, even though this is our mission, um, in terms of making sure that economy is strong, we do it with uh, the budget is less, per, less than 1% of the state budget. So just imagine the, the, um, the surplus that we have uh, is close to, I would say close to 10 billion uh, because we haven't received the American Rescue Plan money yet. So, um, so we do all of this work and um, we have an amazing staff to do these things. So we do a lot of inspections. Um, we do a lot of um, traveling to farms and making sure that um, we are uh, making sure that everyone is, is being responsible and taken care of. Next slide. So <laughs> about three weeks ago, I went to California for the, um, the um, natural, natural West Expo, which is the largest um, organic and food uh, show in the world. So I was there and it was great to see 60,000 people, um, but I also saw that it was $7 a gallon. Um, and so I saw this and I said, it is an arm in the lake. Cause I was just gassing up the other day and I, I was 409. I said, wow, 409. And that continues to go up. And you're thinking about the, uh, the supply chain. So where is agriculture today? 
Next slide. So if you go to our, our home page right now, this is what we're dealing with, front and center. Tom is up in Wilma right now with Andrea uh, and the governor dealing with this uh, high path. Um, it's now in uh, 15 farms are, um, are affected right now, so that's a half a million birds and counting. Uh, we're actually doing better here than, than um, Iowa. Iowa is at five million and counting. And so um, the incident management team is working 24 hours a day to try to contain this. And so this has sort of been sort of the talk of what's happening at the legislature too, because coupled with this, prior to this happening, we were dealing with trying to get the drought package passed. And this is the drought from last year. And so Tom has been really working hard to make sure that um, they pass it now and not after they come back from the break that starts today, um, their, their Easter break. Um, but these are the type of things that are happening and these are the, the things that are always uh, top of mind when you're thinking about uh, food safety. So next. So this is, this is what you see, right? You see a lot of gabbling. You, have, you see a lot of people trying to work together. Um, I know you, people have definitely seen a lot of issues around uh, schools uh, going on strike. And just the other day, uh, Melissa Hortman was uh, proposing to have a billion dollars uh, for all the schools. And um, the other side said, no, they'll just give you, we gave you 30 million last year, and we don't have to give you anything this year. So we're going to still continue to work on that process. But um, I think the more money that we have, the more problems. <laughs> it's, it, it really is that way. Uh, next slide. So the issue that we deal with, um, that I deal with quite a bit, um, is not just the black farmers, but since we have 11 uh, tribal nations in Minnesota, you're dealing with those issues as well. And trying to make sure that farmers are um, being counted in terms of where they are in the state. So the last ag census was in 2017. The next one is in November of this year. And so uh, you can go to the next slide. We always are trying to find out where are emerging farmers in the state. Now these, these uh, green spots that you see are um, where a lot of the emerging farmers that are on the working group, this is where they're, they're from. But as you can see on the western side of the state, it's pretty blank. And so one thing that we always have to deal with um, is where are, uh, the emerging farmers, but also the definition of what is an emerging farmer. Next. I would say that an emerging farmer is anyone that has zero to 10 years experience. And most of the emerging farmers are located in the seven county metro, mostly in Hennepin County. Um, but, uh, but they could also be in any one of these, um, these first seven. Uh, we, we try to make sure that when it comes to land, which is one of the, the number one barriers, that people know where the land is. And I was just having a conversation with um, Angela Connolly, who's the Hennepin County Commissioner, and she was telling me that they have land there. And I said, well, how much land are we talking about? She said, there's land everywhere in Hennepin County. And some land is 25 cents for, I don't know, this, the lot size is what I'm trying to get, but it's 25 cents. She says some is $20. I said, this is good. So I'm talking to these merchant farmers and I told them that you have to take what was there. But the most important thing, you also have to be a part of these organizations. And so, so these are the stats. Again, this is from the 2017 census. So what I circled here was if you're looking at black indigenous people of color, which also includes veterans and um, women entrepreneurs, you know, this number is very startling if you're thinking about um, 11,000 farms in Minnesota. Um, when it comes to dairy, we are less than 2,000. You know, we're sort of under that 2,000 um, farm uh, metric right now. But these, these numbers are, um, are pretty stark. 
the thing that I, I have grown to know is that there are lots of groups that have uh, different emerging farmers, but not everybody is a renter and not everybody's an owner. And so that really just sort of distinguishes uh, the difference between the two. So my hope is that uh, we actually increase these numbers three or fourfold um, and really get a chance to actually see where, where people are and ways in which we can actually service everybody. You can go to the next slide. So again, um, so what is an emerging farmer? Um, it really depends because you can have someone that uh, is here from Ukraine today and um, want to get into agriculture tomorrow. I would consider that person an emerging farmer because they have the interest of being going from a consumer to a producer. So uh, that's usually uh, what we're looking for. Uh, next slide. So in 2019, uh, one, of, one of the things that I was charged to do was to put together an emerging farmer uh, listing session. We did listing sessions. And these are just 26 of the, the many uh, um, barriers that we heard of. And as you can see in the middle, it talks a lot about mental health, lack of insurance. And so it's not always finances and, um, and land, but it's also looking at um, you know, student loan debt can actually prevent you from getting uh, certain things. The farm business management uh, program or having a farm business manager uh, in the metro is something that we've been working with uh, Keith Olander from Central Lakes College. So that is going to happen, hopefully in the next two weeks. Um, but really trying to make sure that uh, emerging farmers stay in the black. And so uh, there's lots of different uh, ways that we're looking at it, but trying to get people to be a part of having a, a, a farm advocate as a, as a mentor. Um, but these are just some of the, the barriers. Next slide. So if you look in that, in this, this particular slide is, 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 uh, is always bothered me because if you're looking at uh, racial inequality, uh, you're looking at issues of equity, which is really what it is, making sure that everyone has the same opportunities across the board. Um, but if you're thinking about what's happening in the last two years in the pandemic, we've had more people that are out of work, sort of went out of the workforce, and now really trying to reclaim them to come back. And so in the ag budget, uh, we actually proposed that we had a lot of rapid response grants, mostly in the region five and the region nine part of the state, um, just to get more people to, um, to get back into agriculture. But housing and um, the supply chain, um, gasoline prices, and you know, those are some of the issues that people are having to navigate right now in regards to uh, inflation. And so uh, we're in a very interesting time when it comes to agriculture. Uh, but again, we're in a good position in regards to uh, agriculture here in Minnesota. So these were uh, some images from the listening session. Um, uh, we did six of those around the state. And the, the listening sessions really were to identify what the barriers were at the time. So now that we have the Emerging Farmer Working Group, uh, now we're in the spot where we know what the barriers are, how do we uh, address them, which we're doing right now, but then what's the next step beyond this is sort of where we are. So tomorrow I'm gonna join um, Lieutenant Governor up in Sandstone um, to look at a, um, a farm up there because she wants to look at the farm and, um, and kind of see different ways in which you know, she, can, um, she can help. You can go to the next slide. And then the, the next one after this, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, last, le last legislative session, we actually uh, received quite a few things. And one thing that we re received was an emerging farmer um, office. No other uh, Department of Agriculture 
Um, you know, I've spoken to quite a few, even have emerging farmers as part of their portfolio. But we do have one, and we're in the process of building that out and what those things look like. We had one um, um, a hearing about this report, and uh, so we're hoping that they put some money into some infrastructure uh, for that particular office, but um, we're just building things out right now. So the things that are happening next and what's going on is we're doing promotional um, opportunities right now, developing sort of a working draft for the next three years because uh, this working group technically is supposed to sunset in 2025. We wanted to go into perpetuity and go beyond that. So, um, but these are just some of the things that we've been doing and working with um, different stakeholders um, and we're working with uh, trying to get a farm advocate um, to help emerging farmers as well. So, next slide. So these are some of these some current opportunities that we've been able to uh, to do since the office was um, it hasn't even been publicly announced yet, but we've had some really amazing opportunities to be able to to reach out to Fond du Lac in terms of the certification program, White Earth. Um, you have been working with uh, Hennepin County on some land issues, um, but really trying to expand. And the person that I hired for this particular, uh, she's just an office of one. So I told her that you can't be everywhere. So you got to be creative of how you do it. But no, uh, we've been really um, thankful that we've been uh, trying to get the word out uh, before it gets announced. Next slide. So, um, we have to go, yeah. So this is the new agriculture license plate. It's the first ag plate in the state. Um, and it's doing pretty well for as far as I know. I got my plate in the mail last week. But the great thing about this plate, and one of the things that, that I was uh, sharing with, um, with Val Oswald and Jennifer Scusa, who are the FFA and 4-H leaders, is that you have to look beyond today, as my, um, my, um, the title of this presentation, because agriculture is changing as baby boomers are continuing to uh, retire at a rapid rate. You have more people that are emerging, if you will. People are younger that are thinking about land transfer and also uh, some uh, farmers are thinking about the heirs. Some of the heirs don't want to take over the farm, so then what? And, and so um, the plate really has um, a credence to that. The thing that you don't see in the plate, and this is on purpose, is that you don't see the, the two logos of FFA and 4-H, even though they are the beneficiaries of the finances that come for this for programming, because they wanted the plate to be um, supporting agriculture for all, that that wouldn't be a barrier. That people wanted the plate, but they weren't a member of that particular, um, uh, or the, these two organizations. So, um, so that's, that's the plate. It's available at any DMV right now. Um, and please support these two organizations. And um, next slide. Thank you guys so much. If you um, take a picture of this QR code, it, Hopefully, it will take you to the Emerging Farmer Working Group webpage, which also uh, has the meeting. Uh, we have our meeting this Friday. Um, the working group meeting is available to, to all. Um, but we really start to tackle some issues at each of the meetings. And this particular one, we're going to be, amongst other things, we're going to be talking about farm business management and the scholarship opportunities that uh, are existing. Other than that, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, and if anyone has any questions. We got time for a few questions. Let's give a brief round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, by the way. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what advice or words of wisdom do you give to young climbers or people who are like prospective climbers? What kind of wisdom would you share with them? You know, um, one thing about, how many people know anything about Farm Fest? So Farm Fest um, is kind of like, I, I sort of think of it as the state fair for agriculture before the state fair. And this is sort of all the, the movers and shakers are, are there. Um, one of the things that you don't see there is a ton of diversity, but uh, one thing that happened last year, which was the first of my three years of going, is there being a lot of conversation about uh, membership. How do we get more diversity within our membership groups? Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, uh, Second Harvest, um, and so uh, Farmers Union actually two days ago uh, created a membership category specifically for uh, emerging farmers and 16 and above. And the one thing that I always tell emerging farmers is that even though you don't have any land, be a part of these organizations because that's your lifeline into agriculture. If you don't have that, you won't really do well up here. And so, um, and if you are a member, you can still make the case that even though I'm a member, I don't have any, I, don't, I still don't have land. So that could still be an issue that, um, that could be top of mind. But those are the type of things always say you have to be involved and increase your networks within these groups. But if you think of any questions, my contact info is there. Um, and I just want to say thank you guys so much for having me. And if you have uh, any need for the license plate, just go get it. <laughs> great opportunity. It looks good when it comes back uh, with your, your information. So thank you guys. <laughs>